Hey, Edwin. Uh, nice to finally put a name to face. I think it's always exciting when we're building in crypto that it's really hard to sometimes uh, see everyone in, in real life. So uh, thankfully, you. I think that's one of the benefits of being able to build in this ecosystem, right, where we can give opportunities to users to invest and use our protocols, even if we've never met in real life. So yeah, really excited to have you and uh, uh, share uh, more to our users about Bricken today. Uh, obviously, I think many users have already seen Bricken live on Impossible's Launchpad uh, and website. And as always, you can always uh, stake any time during the process of the sale uh, to be able to get your allocation. So uh, without further ado, I think everyone would love to dive a bit deeper into some of the things that you've been obviously working very hard on uh, over at Bricken. So I think the first uh, question that our community wanted to ask a bit uh, about was actually how did you guys kind of start? Obviously, the real world asset ecosystem is definitely one that I think is uh, still untapped uh, or at least undertapped inside crypto. Um, and obviously, you guys have a lot of I think interesting experience both pre crypto as well as now uh, after starting Bricken. So, would love to maybe uh, hear a little bit more of your kind of founder story on this. Yes, of course. Uh, well, I mean, my background is I'm a mergers and acquisition lawyer. So I was doing a lot of restructuring of companies here in, in Europe, especially. So one of the things I saw was the inefficiency about how transmission of assets happens sometimes between companies and the equity on the raising of capital. There's a very bureaucratic and very um, static in the sense that it's still very paperweight, kind of like it's heavy. So um in the sense that we wanted to do uh we started focusing on real estate uh tokenization that was how we entered the market because we saw that we can provide efficiencies through the use of technology such as blockchain especially when you want to raise capital or you want to transmit or provide the dividends or the interest that is gathered through the real estate and that way we we entered and then once we started analyzing more of the market itself from the inside now that you're a player we started seeing that maybe this could be applied to absolutely everything. So we shouldn't focus just on real asset and we shouldn't be us the one tokenizing. We should be creating a protocol that other companies can use to deploy their assets on their own terms. So kind of like just become a software provider. So the more we started engaging, the more we started obviously gathering know-how, exposure, we started understanding that, yeah, why not? I mean. In the end, what you're doing through the tokenization of transforming any kind of asset, digitize them and put them on chain, uh, you can really provide this kind of like, first of all, no intermediary setup. And then secondly, um, more efficiency to the process, more transparency and more engagement between the issuer and the investor. So in that sense, what we created was kind of like that possibility. You know? We call ourselves an enabler more than like a tokenizer because we enable tokenization and companies come to us to gather that technology so they don't even have to develop because it's kind of like why would they develop that technology it doesn't make sense they have to focus on their un unique selling point and we have to provide them that structure for them to continue on their journey of business but not develop the technology so that's how actually nowadays it's what is breaking that's amazing yeah i think um like you said, being able to let builders focus. And uh, I think that's the core of being a, a, a cornerstone infrastructure for the space so that then people can focus on just the business logics of what they need to build uh, and that you can take care of a lot of the rest. So I, I really love that kind of philosophy. I think a lot of our users probably still uh, would love to learn a little bit more from you, kind of, as you mentioned, this separation between enabling others uh, rather than just being, uh, you know, pushing out assets yourself. Um, I think this is a, a really cool uh, kind of point. And I think maybe you could walk us through a little bit of a sample flow of what it looks like for, let's say, one of these teams to uh, bring their business into an on-chain world via Brick. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the main difference is kind of like, uh, okay, we're, I'm not going to simulate this for a purpose of example. Uh, what Ethereum did to the to the whole world was provide kind of like just an infrastructure that people go in and they plot their smart contracts and they don't have to worry about how they're going to connect with all the different layers or all the all the nodes or whatever. Kind of like it's infrastructure, right? So we, if you grab that concept, you can provide it to absolutely anything you want. Kind of like you don't have to worry about running that technology. You just have to make sure that you use it. So 
to make it less complex, when we started, we were the ones saying, I own everything. I'm the tokenizer. So you come to me, I grab your assets, and I tokenize wherever I think I need to tokenize. So I was choosing jurisdiction. I was choosing methodology. I was doing absolutely everything. So that's very hard to scale because you take responsibility on absolutely everything. And for us, it was a heavy burden because we have to understand absolutely everything, every business model, every single asset. So during the first year and a half, we did that. It, thought, it did provide us a lot of know-how because we can talk about different kind of business. We learn a lot about other people because we have to do the whole structure ourselves. So instead of doing that, what we thought about it is kind of like, why don't we go for that decentralized model where we are the infrastructure layer where companies can only have to provide the asset inside that layer and they do it on themselves. Because in the end, they're the best that know their business. They're probably located in Panama or, or Japan. It doesn't matter because we shouldn't be the ones saying, let me grab your asset and let me deploy it in my jurisdiction or Spain, because we're based in Spain, where, where the Japanese company will come and say, no, but I'm in Japan. Why would I go to Spain? It doesn't make sense. So the more we started understanding this, we were like, we need to provide that technology for them to deploy wherever they want on their own terms, in their own means. And then that gives them freedom and us, it allows us to scale because we don't have that necessity of us doing everything for them. We just have to worry that the technology works, they have the tools, they have the functionalities, and they understand how it is. So instead of focusing on that part, we started focusing on user experience. How can we onboard companies with all the know-how that we have about tokenization for them to gather that technology and say like, okay, in a couple of clicks, I'm done. So we changed from this centralized model where we're doing everything, we were the point of authority into a decentralized model where we were worrying more about the user experience for the companies, especially Web2, to say like, oh, okay, I'm using technology without even thinking that I'm using blockchain. That was kind of like, how can we accomplish this? Yeah, I think uh, making the magic happen behind the scenes and then not needing to have all these teams worry about exactly how it's done, I think is exactly the way to go as an infrastructure provider, help these teams uh, incorporate blockchain without maybe all of the pain of uh, feeling an integration, right? Um, so I think you have some really great perspective on that. I think our team obviously also does a lot of deep due diligence into the macro sectors that we see, uh, which allows us to formulate a thesis to pick uh, projects like Brick and our building in sectors that we're interested in. Um, as uh, you kind of touched on it, um, you know, it's hard to scale to be able to capture everything if you control every single parameter that teams uh, uh, want to have in the process of uh, bringing assets on chain. Um, but we did see some uh, general global macro research that suggested that the asset tokenization market may reach around 16 trillion by the end of the decade. Um, for you, I think you already kind of touched some part of this where you believe that uh, in order to really scale and grow with the market, you need to make sure that there's certain parts that you control and certain parts that you let the, the individuals um, that want to issue assets uh, kind of uh, uh, take into the matters of their own hands. And so for, for you guys, I think it'd be really interesting to share a little bit of how uh, maybe in terms of timelines or uh, kind of strategy, you mentioned obviously your own background, uh, doing a lot of work in Europe. Um, you know, how do you guys kind of start to try and bootstrap to eventually capture a larger chunk of this future uh, on-chain world? Well, of course. I mean, one of the main things about why we decided to change was to scale up. We saw that us doing everything, we will be very slow. Because when you have to do that, you become the consultant, you become the technology provider. It, it's very heavy. So we wanted to obviously go lean on that. So to capture value, first of all, we have to break our technology and our concept. Because to hit 16 trillion, obviously I'm not gonna say, say like, yeah, we're gonna own 16 trillion, no. But let's say we capture just what? A hundredth of that, that puts us already as a unicorn because it's 16 trillion that it's happening between today and 2030, according to some uh, big consultancies such as Boston Consulting or whatever, Eastern John. So that means that right now the, the market is currently valued at, a at 200 billion. 
If you put that into concept, that means that there's still 16.8, the 15.8 trillion waiting to happen. So in seven years, there's going to be a digitization of assets of 15 trillion. If you put that number into concept, when we were in 2021, cryptocurrency market hit the all time high of 3 trillion. So there's more assets in the world than cryptocurrencies were in 2021 because the whole world runs still on assets. So to capture that value, you really need to set up right now the foundation, the brand, the position, and the authority. Kind of like we have to go right now and be fast, efficient, but still show our power to like the world that, hey, we're doing this and we're becoming one of the prime players because we already have the know-how. So tell, telling you this story, why? Because nowadays we're seeing a couple of projects starting up on digitization of assets. The problem with digitization of assets or real world assets organization is that it's not just technology that runs it. It's know-how at the legal, financial, because there's a lot of accountability on transactions happening and whatnot, tokenomics, financial. Then obviously marketing, you need a heavy um, uh, inflow of potential investors into projects. So it's not an easy vertical. Since it's a complex vertical, we do have right now the, the upper hand because we started in 2020 understanding the market, talking to regulators, working alongside them, uh, getting exposure. Uh, we did some simple things as to gather a lot of SEO. We own a lot of keywords on Google, uh, real world asset organization, first page, uh, tokenization of assets, first page. So we started doing a lot of things that we have a lot of inbound already. We're starting to generate approximately 50 leads per week, not qualified, but 50 potential companies that want to start triggering the, the tokenization. So that's a lot. Obviously, it's not qualified. There's a lot of uh, not potential tokenization that can occur. So we, we just don't pay attention to them. But it does gather a lot. Now we also have the Cointelegraph acceleration program. So we have a lot of channels of exposure from Cointelegraph itself. We're in the build program with Chainlink. So we have a lot of partnership agreements happening through the Chainlink program. So we did a lot of positioning and that's why we're finishing our race because now with the new inflow of cash, we're gonna start exposuring a lot of marketing because even though it's a bear market, which for us is crucial, like it's been very hard for us, like every single out there project and company right now, but it's crucial in the sense that new builders are gonna have 100 times harder to raise capital than us. If it's hard for us, I don't wanna know how hard it is for the new companies to enter in the space. But then again, that we have to think about it, that's an advantage because we're closing deals, we're getting funded from retail, from institutional, from VCs, business angels. So we're gathering everything that we have to position ourselves in this year. A lot of companies won't make it, but by the next year, we go with a lot of capital already raised with the positioning and the greatest strategic partners, even such as Impossible Finance, which we gather a lot of interest through this channel because we got already a lead on, on a tokenization because like, yeah, I saw you in the launch, but what are you guys doing? So that was like every single thing that we do, we have to capture and turn it into a potential qualified lead. So right now it's more about positioning ourselves because when the market hits green, if we are already here and the competitors are here, obviously we are already like a, 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 a company of interest for a lot of people because people like to talk to the big guy. They don't like to talk to the new guy. That's the hardest conversion, but we already went through all of that. Amazing. Yeah, I think you already touched actually on a lot of the questions I was going to ask you in, in this very complete answer. So I of was course. trying to figure out how how, how do I try to uh, tweak the question a bit? So you already shared a little bit of your competitive advantage on that, given that you guys, uh, you know, do want to make sure that this scales and also make sure that, uh, you know, we are uh, positioned to be that kind of go-to cornerstone for when we see market conditions, uh, encourage even more teams to want to bring their assets on chain. I think you already touched on actually some of the uh, partnerships as well that you've had. Maybe uh, that would be my last question for this section as well. Uh, if you could share a little bit more of any of the other partners you already mentioned, Chainlink, obviously ourselves at Impossible, and I'm sure you've got plenty others. Do you have any other partners that you wanted to highlight to some of the community here as well? 
Yeah, I mean, I think one of our biggest competitive advantage besides how we trigger is the partners, right? I always, I always thought that one of the most important things is I can come up to you, Calvin, and say like, hey, I'm good, I'm very good. And you'll be like, yeah, but you're telling me yourself, like, are you megalomania? That doesn't make sense, man. But if somebody else comes to you and you see me working with X, kind of like, I don't know, whatever, the president of Spain, you'll be like, oh, this guy is good. I mean, he's working with the president of Spain, so when he says he's good, he must be good. This is called the validation phase. So during the last two years, what we try to accomplish was like gather as much partners as possible, sign as many agreements as possible, because in the end, no matter how good you think you are, which we think we're very good, important thing is who thinks we're good, right? So this is the concept about why we enter Cointelegraph, why we have the chain link, why we have a couple of VCs, why we enter into launchpads, but also why we started working alongside the government in Europe, that position us a lot because we did a test with the Spanish Security Exchange Commission for the digitization of assets. We got the grant from the Spanish government, so we got 350K from the government of Spain for us to develop our tech. So there's an interest there. And then we started going through a lot of law firms, big four consultancy firms, because in the end, we needed to go through that process because it works sideways, kind of, it, it works uh, by, by, in both ways. If I sign an agreement, for example, with Deloitte, then the Lloyd people know they have already a partner for tokenization, but this is kind of like also word of mouth, kind of like if they're going to come up with a client, they're going to say like, hey, why don't you check Bricket? They might not have an exclusivity, but then, but for us, every time there's an event with certain companies, we already get invited to, to speak to departments and everything. So it's kind of like out of this slow process of gathering partners, signing agreements, we are now seeing kind of like picking up the seats. Then we have the huge ones like the coin teller and the chain link that just boosted us a lot. Because in the end, when a company goes and looks for a competitor, in the end, it's also technology, how easy it is. There's a lot of things, but you always want to work with the best. So now when they come to us, it's like, oh, your tech is great, but you know, you have maybe competitors. We always invite them to check that kind of like go check the process. We believe our process is better because we're thinking Web3 in the sense that it's decentralized, it's investor based, it's user centric. There's a lot of things that are very neat on how we think of Web3 rather than Web2. And we are very advanced in functionalities and tools because we as builders in Web3 are used to just doing everything on our own. Kind of like we try to make that thing happen. But now it's like, uh, yeah, but look at my partner so i mean in the end we are already validated so i don't have we don't have to tell our clients like hey we're very good we just say like hey this is our list of partners just google this brick in i mean in the end you want to work with somebody trustworthy and i we believe that we did a great work at marketing especially building uh, bridges with partners for us to be able to get into that situation where i don't have to tell you who i am you can just google it yourself Actions always speak uh, much louder than words. So uh, I think that's a great note to end this uh, interview on. I think Evan, thanks so much for sharing so much about you know your journey about this, the the amount of learnings that you've taken over the last few years to kind of see brick into this current firm, uh, and I guess obviously all of our public users at Impossible now get the awesome opportunity to be able to invest in brick in. So if you. you haven't yet staked that. Uh, uh, Impossible's website, you can drop by app.impossible.finance uh, to get your allocation and get ready for uh, the upcoming sale. And then if you want to learn more on all things Bricken, uh, the website is here as well. So Bricken.com. Thank you so much, Edwin. And we enjoy uh, all the different ideas that we've been able to share with you on our due diligence journey. And we're excited to share a lot more of uh, what you guys have been working with the community over here at Impossible. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Cheers.